All right, well, grab your your Bibles now, Acts chapter 20, and we will be uh, in this opening portion of this of this chapter, which is uh, the end of uh, the Apostle Paul's free life, if you could say he ever was free. Uh, his ministry as a free man will actually come to an end in chapter 21. This is his last church meeting, his last conversation before he's arrested, and will never really be released from uh, chains until the day of his, of his death later on in his life. And so here's a period of time where the Apostle Paul has been free, but again, I don't know if he really ever was free as he was a man, you could say, taken captive by the Lord to do the Lord's will. He was, he was a man who had his life on mission for sure. And so we'll consider the Apostle Paul's life as he, as he shares a, a touching message uh, with uh, the folks at Ephesus, the elders at Ephesus, uh, there on the shores of Miletus. And we'll, look, we'll take two weeks to look at this, uh, this passage and this message that he has, the last face-to-face meeting he'll have with some, some people that he really deeply loved and ministered to. Um, I'll be gone next week. Uh, I'll be sharing at a, a, a men's retreat at Calvary Chapel in Rathdrum, Idaho, and we'll be just north of, of, of there at the retreat center. Uh, Joshua Pummel, uh, our college pastor, will be sharing the word with us next Sunday. So really looking forward to that, uh, having Josh here in the pulpit. So um, with that, uh, we consider one solitary life, or how the Lord used the Apostle Paul's life for his kingdom purposes. Uh, they, uh, that, that phrase, one solitary life, might, might strike a memory chord for you. And, and it's, there's a poem written about the life of Jesus, of course, called One Solitary Life. And I'll read that here in a minute to us. Uh, But what we realize is that the Lord has, uh, through now the death and resurrection of the Lord, poured his spirit out on the church. And and there's this great, great work that the Lord is doing in the lives of his people. So as we study Paul's life today, my goal is to see the life of Christ within it. Uh, Paul's life is truly reflective of the ministry of Jesus And I want us to be encouraged as we gaze upon our Lord today and and consider his life lived for us. But then also be mindful of uh, not only of Paul's life as that example that points really to the life of Christ, but how is that life being manifest in us? And what has the Lord called us to? It's just a question I believe we should always be asking as we abide in the Lord that he he might send us and, and use us as he sees fit. Uh, So let's pray and we'll study this passage of scripture uh, before us. Father, thank you so much for your great and abiding love in our our lives. Uh, We thank you so much for who you are and for what you've done. And we thank you ultimately, Heavenly Father, for sending your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into this world uh, to pay the penalty for our sin, rise again from the grave to give us eternal life through our faith, our our trust in you, in the gospel. And Lord, we know that you've taken out an old heart, a heart of stone, you've given a new heart. Uh, You've given us of your spirit. Uh, You've called us uh, to serve you, and you have set us apart uh, for your purposes and your plans, for your glory here on earth. And Lord, we want that to be realized. Uh, We we don't want to be those that live this life for ourselves, Uh, but for him who died for us and and rose again. And Lord, make us a part of that, that you're doing here on on the earth today. And Lord, we're thankful for this partnership that we have with you and you have with us in the gospel. Fellow workers, you've called us. uh, And we're we're so thankful for that, Lord. We love you. Uh, We we pray you bless our study now and your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let me read this poem, uh, One Solitary Life. Uh, it's attributed to Dr. James Allen Francis. It's about the life of Jesus. He was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in still another village where he worked at, in a carpenter's sh- shop until he was 30. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never had a family or owned a house. He didn't go to college. He never visited a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place where he was born. 
He did none of the things one usually associates with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33 when the tide of public opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. Uh, while he was dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing. It was the only property he had on earth. And when he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed tomb uh, through the pity of a friend. And now 20 centuries have come and gone. And today, he is the central figure of human history, of the human race and the leader of mankind's progress. <laughs> all the armies that have ever marched, all the navies that have ever sailed, all the parliament that ever sat, all the kings that have ever reigned, put together have never affected the life of man on earth as much as that one solitary life. Of course, this one solitary life was lived by none other than the Son of God, <laughs> which makes that possible. One thing the poem does not mention is his resurrection and that he is still alive and he is still affecting uh, earth and, and mankind and, and human lives on earth. But we know he does that now largely through his church. And by his spirit, working through the word of God and through the church of God, the Lord is still at work and he calls us out of darkness into his marvelous light and he calls us to serve him right, right here. And so it's glorious, the, the purpose and the plan of our life. And so I'd like to begin here uh, at this morning's message where we will end. I'd like to look down at verse 24 and uh, use verse 24 as a, as a jumping point into the text. It'll be the final verse that we'll look at here today. Uh, verse 24 simply says, there the Apostle Paul, he says, none of these things move me. That would be the threat of his, of his own uh, tribulation, chains, imprisonment, possibly even death. He says, I am I'm not moved by the, by the thought of trial. Uh, he says, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy in the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Paul says he does not count his life dear to himself there. I think it's the NIV, maybe also the New Living Translation that translates that phrase. I do not count my life dear to myself to mean to say, uh, uh, translate it saying, um, I do not count my life to be worth anything. Interesting concept, right? That, Paul's not saying, I don't consider my life that it's worthless to God, or that he wasn't saying that I consider my life worthless to others, but he's saying, I don't consider my existence here on earth to be of any real value to me or to be for me. And it kind of cuts against the grain of normal humanistic living, right? Where we live for ourselves, we're so self-centered, so self-consumed that our greatest hope on earth is that finally other people will just realize that we are as important as we think we are. <laughs> and they would finally just do things the way, that, what, they do the way we want things done. Or could they just for, for a minute get out of the way of me fulfilling all of my dreams and, and stop wrecking this purpose and plan I have for my own life? And our lives can be so much valued by us and, and our own goals and our own dreams. And it's all about me. And, the, and Paul didn't see his life that way. He didn't see his life as dear to himself, of something of high value. It, didn't, it wasn't precious to himself. But he believed it was a precious tool in the hand of God to minister to others for the glory of God. And so it is how the Lord calls us to follow him in this course. As the Apostle Paul comes to the end of his ministry as a free man, we see a life so deeply transformed by the gospel that we can't help but see the life of Jesus reflected right here in this passage. And so let's consider the Apostle Paul's life. It was a life on mission. And, and let's see Jesus in his life, shall we? First thing we see in our first six verses this morning was that Paul was a people 
person. We've seen this already about the Apostle Paul, but Paul was a, a people person to be sure. Wherever he went, other people had followed and, and they, they loved Paul as much as he loved them. Verse 1 of uh, chapter 20 now, and verses 1 through 6, it says, After the uproar had ceased, now we find Paul in the city of Ephesus, it was an uproar, a riot at Ephesus. Uh, after that had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself. He embraced them, and he departed to go to Macedonia. So this, this great upheaval changed the apostles' plans a little bit. And uh, he goes to Macedonia rather than his, his aforementioned plans and desire to go down to Achaia first. And so now, probably because of the riot, he has to rush right off. There's a significant point to that. But I just want us to consider as we consider the Apostle Paul as a people person, just even these words in verse 1, where it says that, that he called the disciples to himself, he embraced them, uh, or he greeted them, he spoke to them. Paul was not ready to leave Ephesus, and he just wanted to have some final words, and he wanted to say goodbye. Paul wasn't a guy just to slide out without saying goodbye. He had real deep affection for the people. In verse 2, there's a lot of movement in here that takes place. Um, he, he goes to Macedonia at the end of verse 1. Now when he had gone over that region, that means Macedonia, and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece. Uh, where he then would stay for three months. Uh, but then when the Jews plotted against him, he was about to sail to Syria, and he decided to return through Macedonia. So many months and so much movement between verses 2 and 3. I don't want to get bogged down here. Dr. Luke, who's recording the events, doesn't get bogged down here. But what we have very interesting, uh, when we read the later on epistles, a lot takes place here. First off, uh, Paul goes from Macedonia down to Achaia, back up to Macedonia, then he'll sail over to Miletus. He'll have a conversation with the, the Ephesian elders, and then he'll go over to Jerusalem for Pentecost, and it'll be there that he'll be arrested and his fourth missionary journey in chains. But it's probably during this time that uh, the Corinthians get very frustrated with the Apostle Paul because his first plans were to go directly to them after Ephesus. And they said, Paul, you lied to us. You didn't come, and we really wanted to see you. And that's here where Paul would pen the letter of 2 Corinthians and say, the reason I didn't come to you is because I was going to have to come with a rod and not with a spirit of gentleness. But I love you, and I went up here. It's also here we probably read of the venture over to uh, uh, Paul going over to Iconium and, and preaching uh, the gospel in Romans chapter uh, 15, uh, or I'm sorry, Illyricum, when he said uh, the gospel went all the way over to Illyricum. So we have a lot of movement from the Apostle Paul. Uh, we do find one thing is that as Paul ministered, uh, he ministered to many people. And we find some more of his travel companions in verse 4. Uh, so Peter of Berea accompanied him to Asia. And so notice the various cities these people are from. Uh, remember Paul preached at Berea. Then there was Aristarchus and Secundus from Thessal Thessalonica. They were Thessalonians. There was Gaius from Derby. That would be his first missionary trip to the region of Galatia. Then there was Timothy and Tychicus and, Tr and Trophimus of, of Asia. And so there were, there were men from that, that similar region. Uh, these men going ahead of us waited for us at Troas. Paul would go to Troas uh, on, the, on the way out and then back on the way in. And then we, we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. And, the five days, and then in five days joined them at Troas where we stayed seven days. And so we'll pick up our, Paul's ministry in Troas here. But one thing I just have to note about the Apostle Paul uh, is that People were always around him. Yeah, have you ever heard it said, you'll know you're a leader if you look behind you and people are following? Paul made a real impact in people's lives. He was a people person. Every city that he went to, uh, the people wanted to follow Paul. He was infectious. Uh, his love for the Lord brightened their day and people saw something in him and, and what they saw in him was Christ. And so Paul would say, follow me as I follow Christ. And people would. And they, they just loved him. They didn't want him to leave. And he didn't want to leave. He was kind of torn. He wanted to be in many places at one time. 
And it was all sorts of people, high and low, that Paul had. Even just the two fellows from Thessalonica, or from Thessalonica that are mentioned here, their names are telling. What are their names? Did you? Here's your Bible quiz. I just read them. You should know them. You won't. Okay. Secundus and Aristarchus. Okay. How did you not get that? Okay. So the two fellows from Thessalonica, Secundus and, and Aristarchus, would have been from opposite sides of the social spectrum of their day. Secundus, that's actually the name of a slave. He would have been a second ranking slave. His name literally meaning second. <laughs> And uh, then there was Aristarchus, who would have been of the ruling class. And we see that it was rich, poor, uh, male, female, uh, slave and free alike, that were men, women, drawn to the Apostle Paul into this ministry of the gospel. And all I know is that the Lord loves people. And if you will be a people person, you will have to be an all people person. The Lord hasn't called you just to minister to one select group of individuals, although you may have a sphere of influence more particularly in one spot than another. But it's people around you, people in general, people that you may associate with or may not necessarily naturally associate with that the Lord would want to use you in their lives. Paul would become all things to all men. One of the most telling things about my brother's salvation um, one is he was very peculiar about his friends growing up. Not that people didn't like Steve, it's just that Steve didn't like people. And he would always have one or two friends growing up, and that was by his choice, not theirs. People bugged him and rubbed him wrong, and so he just was a man of a couple friends. And when I went to meet him after his salvation, and I saw this group of people that he was hanging out with, I said, there must be a God. And you must be born again because, Steve, you like people that you would have never liked had you not been born again. And he just had friends in his life that he truly cared for. And I believe Paul is a great picture of Christ here because Christ came and he showed no partiality. And he loves people. And that means the Lord loves me and he loves you. And he loves the person next to you. And, and his grace is sufficient for all of us. And that is who our, our God is. And so Paul reflects the heart of Christ. One other thing I see before we move on to the second point is that Paul loved people even when they didn't love him. And some of that goes into some of his journeying and how 2 Corinthians was written at that time. But remember, Paul would have to say to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians twelve fifteen, he said, I will very gladly spend and be spent for your souls. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I am loved. It is true that Paul loved people, and they didn't always love him. In fact, oftentimes he was attacked. Although there were people that did follow, there were those that resisted. And if you'll follow the Lord, and if you know his heart, you'll know this about the Lord. It's heart for people, is that there's times that the Lord desires to reach others through you, and they're not super happy about that. And there are times that we're ministering to people that want to hold us at arm's length. And we'll, with the Apostle Paul and with the Lord Jesus, can we just resolve to be willing to spend and even be spent for people, even though the more abundantly we love them, the less we might be loved by them. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, and sometimes that, that's resisted by people around us. But Paul was a people person. Uh, Paul was not only a people person, but in verses 7 through 12, Paul was a preacher man. And uh, boy, the guy could preach. Uh, man after my own heart. And verse, uh, verse 7, Paul said, uh, Now after the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread... Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message till midnight. I'm just trying to finish my message by noon. And uh, I think midnight was his stopping time, okay? Uh, Paul preached all the way up till midnight. Most commentators believe there was about a six-hour message that he would have preached. Uh, what's going to happen here is a poor young lad named Eutychus is going to be listening to Paul. And as he's going on and on and on, he's going to fall out of the window dead uh, from the third story up. And so, but first off, I th 
before we get to Eutychus's uh, sleeping death in church, uh, let's consider just the church gathered on the first day. Certainly Paul was a preacher man, but, but before he preached, the church gathered. And it's just a couple significant things from verse 7. One, we read that it was on the first day of the week. You see that there? And that the disciples had come together to break bread. This is significant because the church was gathered on the first day, no longer on the Sabbath day or Saturday. Now the first day of the week, which is Sunday. I would ask you, why are they meeting Sunday evening rather than Sunday morning here at the church? Uh, well, it's the first day of the week, and they would have all worked all day on Sunday. In fact, we take our Sundays for granted. The Lord has changed the way the world operates. We call Sunday the weekend. In the first century, Sunday was Monday. Nobody likes Mondays. Nobody likes Sundays. It was the first day back to business. Saturday was Sabbath rest in the Jewish world, and much of the rest of the world followed, interestingly. Sunday was the first day back. The church had gathered in the evening on Sunday to worship. They had, most of them had worked all day long with the rest of the world. Now they're very tired, but Paul had much to say, and so he preaches. They also came together to break bread on that day and remembering the Lord's death and resurrection. So it is that we have today, that we follow this tradition, the church gathering to remember that what the Lord has accomplished for us at Calvary on the first day of the week. Maybe we, you need to redeem your thought of what Sunday is. It's not just a day of secular rest, but it's a day of worship. It is a day for the church to rest well. It's the Lord's day. But it's also a day for us to remember well what the Lord has done for us at Calvary. And it's a day for us to worship well as we take time with the Lord and take time with family and celebrate the resurrection from the grave. Well, as Paul was, was here preaching, he continues his message till midnight. And let's see what takes place in verse 8. It says, There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. And in the window sat a young man named Eutychus. Now, this term, young man, would place him between the age of 8 and 14 for this particular dis Greek word description. And, and, and it's this poor, poor kid. I mean, he's doing his best to stay awake. It's probably, he's probably tired, end, end of a long day. Maybe he's done some schooling that day. Um, he's even sitting in a window trying to get some fresh air, probably to stay awake. And it tells us he was overcome by, or he was sinking into a deep sleep, meaning it was a progressive thing. He's fighting against it, but finally he was overcome by sleep. He fell into a coma in church. And, and, and as Paul continued speaking, I mean, poor guy, Poor guy. I mean, Paul's just continuing on, right? And, uh, and he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down and fell on him, embracing him, said, do not trouble yourselves, for his life is in him. Now, when he had come up and broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till daybreak, uh, he, they, they then... Uh, then he departed, and they brought the young man in alive, and they were not a little comforted, I, I would say, say so. Now, this passage of Scripture, first off, lends itself uh, to, to humor immediately. I mean, all the jokes that could go on, and be careful not to fall, in, uh, fall asleep in church, you know, fall out of the pew, taken up dead, and all, of, and all of these things. But it also can lend itself to a bunch of sermon fodder. Uh, which might not necessarily be the point of the text, such as, hey, beware of spiritual lethargy. In essence, falling asleep in church spiritually. Now, certainly, the Bible makes that point clearly. Though, you know, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands. Uh, so shall your poverty come upon you uh, like a prowler, your need like an armed man. We're, we're called to be alert and awake spiritually. Um, we could even think of Romans 11. Or Romans 13, 11 through 12. Here I'm sneakily making a point without even making this point. Uh, uh, Romans 13, 11 through 12. Do this knowing the time that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, right? The night is far spent. The day is at hand. 
um, or our salvation nearer than when we first believed, night far spent, day is at hand, therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. And so we could, we could talk about the dangers, uh, dangers of spiritual lethargy here. But you know what? I, I don't think that was the point, although I will urge you, uh, don't tune out. Don't fall asleep in church. You, know, you never know. Might meet, you might meet with your demise. Um, I often have people say, oh, boy, I'm sorry for sleeping in church. I'm like, you just outed yourself, you know, because when I'm teaching, my eyes are scanning for eyes. I'm looking around the room to converse with people. And if you're hiding behind the head behind you and snooze, and I probably won't even notice, but your conscience won't let you get away with it, and you'll come up and apologize to me later. And so <laughs> one way or another. But what is this passage really all about? I believe it's about the power of the gospel. And so I'm not going to beat you up for being able to stay very much awake and alert during a two-hour movie, but can't stay awake for a 30-minute sermon, or a three-hour football game and, and on the edge of your seat and cheering and root, rooting and hollering and, and not f- for a 30-minute sermon again, because it would be an unfair equation there. Both of those things that I mentioned are entertainment. Of course, you can stay away, awake for entertainment. This is not entertainment. This is more like history class. You're like, <gasps> like, what is the purpose of this? And the Bible can seem very boring indeed, like math class or like history class, where we're like, I don't get it. And what's it even for? And what's the purpose of it? Well, math or physics may indeed be challenging, but if you're going to the moon, then all of a sudden it's the most thrilling information on the planet. And you're you're into this because the numbers matter. We're going to the moon. And the Bible is the same thing. It's It's the same truth, but it's greater than math and it's greater than physics. Well, it contains physics. It's it's the very message to the world. And once we get beyond, it's just a history lesson to this is the, the very necessity for my life. Then it's like, like, I I have to hear more. The apostle Paul preached for six hours, but he was not like some preachers where, you know, there's a difference between Speaking because you have to say something and speaking because you have something to say. It's not like Paul says, it's not like they said, hey, Paul, can you fill a six hour slot for us? And he's like, boy, what am I going to say for six hours? But I guess I have to get up and say something. No, Paul had something to say in his six hour message in his mind and in his heart. This is the peril of preachers. Sorry. Would have seemed like six minutes to him. People are like, you're going long. We're like, I've just started. Like, I can't even clear my throat in 30 minutes. Like, this information is so exciting, so thrilling. It's life-changing. Well, Paul preached for six hours. This boy falls down dead. Now, in the first century, they may not have had the same medical advancements that we have today, but they weren't stupid. And they knew the difference between a boy that was unconscious and a boy that was dead. And even Dr. Luke was with him is the we pronouns have already picked back up. And some have said, oh, he was probably just resuscitated. No, he died and he came back to life. Certainly they knew the difference. Paul then raises this boy, life on life, and then Paul comes back up, and then what happened? Again, I just read it. Were you paying attention when I read it? How long did Paul preach after? Did they just all pack up and go home? Like Paul's like, boy, I'm really sorry for preaching all the way up till midnight. We're killing people over here. Let's just all go home and get our rest. <laughs> what happened? How long did he preach? Did you see it? It says there that he continued preaching until daybreak. He had one more six-hour sermon. That was just the middle point. Verse 11. But you know what I believe happened from midnight to 6 a.m.? Everybody was on the edge of their chair. It was quite an attention-getting tactic, except it wasn't. It was, it, what it was, is the spirit of the living God made this truth palpable. It, made it, it brought it right to the place of reality. 
It's like the Bible seems boring until somebody's dead. And then you're like, and then he was raised to life. And what a picture of the gospel. And the part where they broke bread and shared in communion, that took place after this. Can you imagine them passing the bread around after Eutychus has been raised in the cup? And they're like, this is what happened. Jesus died and rose again. I'm like, I was destined for hell and now it's new life. And it was like the most vivid, most needed information ever. They were on the edge of their seats and Paul just kept talking. And so it is with the word of God. It's, it's palpable, it's tangible, and it gives life. 2 Timothy 1.10 says, but now God... Uh, but now Christ has, 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 but has now revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has uh, abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. It's kind of picking up mid-sentence, I know. But the Lord, through the gospel, life and immortality are brought to light. Life, think about it, and immortality are brought to light through the gospel. That's why Paul kept preaching till midnight. Life for human souls and immortal life, eternal life. Could there be a more thrilling subject to behold? So Paul was a preacher man. uh, And uh, so Paul was a people person. Paul was a preacher man. And Paul was a man on a mission, as we consider here in verse 17. Um, Sorry, verse 13, we have a little bit more movement before he gets to uh, uh, the shores of Miletus for a beautiful last time meeting with the Ephesian elders. Uh, He moves on at verse 13. uh, Then we went ahead to the ship and sailed to Asos. They're intending to take Paul on board. Well, why wasn't Paul with them? Listen, after preaching all night, what did Paul want to do at the end of verse 13? This is phenomenal. For he had given orders intending himself to go on foot. He's like, you guys go ahead. You sail on the boat. I'm just going to walk there. Like the guy just was like, he just kept going. And they're like, Paul, come on, get on the boat. Verse 14. And when he met them at Asos, we took him on board, maybe physically, like literally. And, uh, and came to Mytilene. And then we sailed from there the next day and came to to Chios. Uh, The following day, we arrived at Samos and stayed at Tragalium. The next day, we came to Miletus. So that's a shore, that's a a port town south of Ephesus, uh, would be in present day Turkey, Asia Minor. Uh, Verse 16, for Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus. So he, he would not have to spend time in Asia. He, didn't, he thought, if I go to Ephesus, it's going to take a long time because I love those people so much. I'm going to get invited here and there and there and there. And so let's, how about I just go to Miletus and invite those guys to come. And we'll have a beachside meeting. Um, and he was also maybe concerned about being arrested because last time he was there, it was a great riot. And he really desired to get to Jerusalem to worship. And so he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of Pentecost. So just a little bit more of Paul's missionary. But he was a man on mission. Like he was a man on a mission. And he, he was a worshiping man. And he was a going man and a traveling man and a walking man. Like, I just want to go. And so then from my lead us, and can you feel the gentle breezes of the, of the sea? Uh, blowing past, and and here we see Paul on a shore. We should probably picture some boats in a harbor nearby, some birds chirping, the Ephesian elders coming, sitting around Paul, and he's going to have one last conversation with these friends whom he loves. It's going to conclude with them weeping on his neck, accompanying him to the ship, crying because it's the last time they're ever going to see him, okay? It's that kind of meeting. It's a swan song. This is what's most important in my life. Paul is no longer going to be a free man after this. And so he says, guys, if I could say anything to you before I go and I'm arrested and eventually killed, let me just tell you this. And he's going to first give her a track record of his life, and then he's going to point them to uh, some exhortation. We'll look at that a couple weeks from now. Uh, But first he just says, you know. You see in verse 18, wouldn't it be great to be able to come to the end of your life? and say, you know that this has been my life. He says, you know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you. Well, you know what? That's true. People do know the kind of life that you're living. (laughs) They're observing it as you go. Have you ever heard the statement, 
live in such a way to where people don't have to lie at your memorial service, <laughs> right? Well, Paul had a track record. And he was able, just like Samuel in the Old Testament, to stand up with people at the end of his life and say, this is the way that I've lived. And what we're going to see here is not only an example from Paul, but we also see a picture of who Jesus is. And really, I believe the people he's called us to be. Paul said, I, I serve the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. Um, so we notice that Paul served and served with humility. And he served through trials and with many tears. Uh, Paul uh, was a man active in ministering to other people. Remember what Paul said in, in Philippians. He said, let each of you look out not only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. Uh, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. If this is God's heart. This is God's heart for us. Paul was a servant. Jesus was a servant. Remember, he said the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life a ransom for many. In fact, Jesus said something very strange in his day. Who is great, greatest among you? He who sits at the table or he who serves? Although we might take it initially to say, oh, he's greater, the one who's, who gets served is greater than the one who serves. The Lord said, no, rather, he who serves is greater. But you know what? I think we would agree with the Lord. Although we do weird stuff when we see celebrities, and we're like, we like lose our minds, we get all giddy, and like we want, like, hey, you don't know me from any, Adam, but could you sign this? It's like the only thing I have, can you sign my chest or whatever? Like, like it's weird, <laughs> but the people that really mean something to us are not people that live their lives for themselves. Come on, it's not the famous people in your life that mean the most to you. Who are the people in your life that you're most thankful for? Think of them. The may, those that have made the biggest impact, those that you would miss the most. I would, I would bet those individuals are servant-minded individuals. People that have gone out of their way to help you, to encourage you, to, uh, to be there for you in time of, in time of need. Of course, we, we have our kids in that, that list, and I know they're more takers than givers, but uh, that's just because God called us to love them unconditionally, and he's put that within our hearts. But truly, those others in our life outside of that immediate family, it's the people that live for others. You know, it's, and it's interesting how we can want to be credited and recognized for all that we do. But in reality, it's, uh, the Lord's called us to serve, and you know how freeing it is to be a servant. To be a humble servant. Oftentimes when we serve, we get so tripped up and we so misunderstand service that we don't even like service because we think, well, if I serve somebody else, who's to say that they're even going to recognize the fact that I've been serving them? They might miss it altogether and they might not credit it for it. They might not give me credit for it. Or it might not be reciprocated by them. And so we have all these hangups to service because it might go unrecognized. And it might not be reciprocated. But what if the Lord just called you just serve just to serve? And what if that's how you looked at your life? Wow, how freeing that would be. You mean, Lord, you've given me life and breath and I can literally, without anybody ever recognizing or reciprocating it, just serve other people for your glory? And you will, you'll find that indeed, it's the greatest life of all. It's the most joyful life of all. Uh, the joy acronym, Jesus first, other second, yourself last, certainly works. And Paul served, and people backed it up, said, yeah, you served, and he served in humility, not crediting himself for it. He served through trials. Uh, he served with tears. Who does all this remind you of? Oh, yeah, Jesus, who came not to be served, but to serve, give his life a ransom for many. Uh, who humbled himself and took on the form of a man and one who became the man of sorrows and acquainted with our own grief. This is the Lord. This is who our Lord is to us. He's come to serve us. He's come to wash our feet. He came to lay down his life for us. Uh, we also read, Paul said, I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it 
publicly to you, verses 21 and 20, or 20 and 21, and from house to house. Paul was going in both public proclamation and from house to house, house churches uh, preaching the word. As many house churches were gathered in that day. And his message was primarily both to Jews and Greeks, testifying to Jews and Greeks, verse 21, repentance toward God and faith toward Jesus Christ. Both are needed. God's holy. Repent before him. You've sinned against him. And the but place your faith in Jesus Christ. There's been a substitution given. This was Paul's message. It was a message of grace. It was a message of salvation. And Paul kept back nothing that is helpful. You know, the Lord's kept back nothing that is helpful for you. And we think about how he's given us his... Second Peter 1, 3 says, he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. The Lord has supplied all our needs. Parents, you'll get this. Your heart for your children is to give them all things that they need, to supply all things that they need to be successful in their future. Think about when your child is an infant and you're, you're feeding, nursing, changing diapers, just like literally 24-hour care that this little infant child can do absolutely nothing and then in the toddler years, you're, you're chasing them around and reading little Bible stories and still putting up with little fussy attitudes and making sure they don't get into the sharp knife drawer and all of this stuff and don't drink the acid from underneath the sink. And, and you're like, you're just like caring for this child. And then they're on into their adolescent years and uh, those preteen years and you're continuing to teach and instruct and helping and, and schooling and re the reading, writing, arithmetic and, and just caring for them, teaching them about the Lord. Uh, all the while you're saving money for their future so you have something for their college, something for their, for their wedding day and you're, you're just there for them, driving them everywhere and then they're teenagers and, and they might want to leave but uh, you're not going to let them leave just yet and and you're and you're talking with them and a lot of the punishment is no longer there but now you're just caring for them talking with them reasoning with them counseling with them in the word of God preparing them for their future then they're out of the house and you still don't you don't stop you're still giving them money you're still offering help and wisdom and you're there throughout their life through their wedding and through their their all of those days and 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 you just never stop caring for them you make sure that they have everything and a parent would give the shirt off his back and the money out of his account and the time and the energy and mom's wiped out for the sake of these kids and if we being evil do that for our children how much more does the Lord assure that we'll have everything we need in this life and especially everything we need for life and godliness and we know one way that he supplies that need to his people whom he loves is through his people whom he loves to one another. And God has called us like he's called the Apostle Paul to assure that the people around us don't lack in anything. That there's wisdom and there's counsel and there's encouragement along the way. At times confrontation, but there's preaching, there's the message, there's the love of the body that edifies the body. And Paul said, I, and I wanted you to know that you, that I kept back, he says, I kept back nothing that was helpful. And I could ask you, are you keeping back something that is helpful for the people around you? And the Lord has called you to serve him. And that is his heart. He's given you much that, that might be there, that it might be an abundance within the body of Christ. And then Paul says this, it, you know, of course, that reminds me of Christ who came and he gave it all. He laid it down his life in verse 22. And Paul says, see, now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me, except I know it's not going to be good. <laughs> verse 23, <laughs> except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city that chains and tribulations await me. People are trying to keep Paul from going to Jerusalem, just as the disciples said to Jesus when he said, let's go up to Jerusalem. They tried to keep him. They said, Lord, last time you were there, they wanted to kill you. And Thomas said, let us go and die with them. And Paul says, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. And everywhere prophecies were given, Paul, things aren't going to be good. And Paul says, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm bound by the Spirit. And you know what Paul had? Paul had this insatiable desire to serve the Lord. He was called to something higher. He was called to something greater. And it's also it's one of the ways you can know you're called to the ministry is if you cannot not go into the ministry. Like, I can't do anything else like this. I'm so called to this 
And I wonder what it is in your life that the Spirit's compelling you to. Remember, Jesus was the same way. His face was set like flint to go to Jerusalem. He had a destiny there. The Lord had called him to that. And what is it that the Lord has called you to that you say, you know what, I'm created for this purpose and I cannot not serve the Lord this way. And even if it means trials and even if it means troubles, none of those things move me. Verse 24, our starting and now our final verse, Paul said, but none of these things move me. Meaning what things? Well, the chains, the tribulations. I'm not concerned in the least about the possibility of imprisonment or even death, he would later say. None of these things move me. Why? Because I do not count my life of something of precious value to me, to serve me. It's not of high value to me. It's not of something of great worth. I do not count my life to be dear to myself. But rather, I just want to finish my race with joy, that which the Lord has set before me. And this ministry, this thing he's called me to do, uh, this ministry that I've received from the Lord Jesus, Jesus called me to do this. I'm going to finish what he's called me to do, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Paul said, my life is not about me. It's for a greater and grander purpose. And if the Lord wants to take me home before it, fine. But I'm go- I just want to finish my race. It was two years ago that COVID hit, almost like to the day when things got locked down two years ago. It's right before March Madness, you know, and it was like, oh, we're not playing the tournament. What happened? And, uh, and I remember those early days, I, COVID lockdowns. I remember just thinking it was very strange. It's like, here's this whole world with one goal. Stay alive. It's like the old song, staying alive, staying alive, you know. And, uh, and, and it's like, everybody's like, stay well, stay home, stay alive. And I'm like, for what? <laughs> like, literally. For what? So you can eat three meals a day and breathe and wake up and put your pants on and go to work one more day? Like for what? Really, what purpose is your life? Is it for you? But when a heart is one to the Lord, it's like this life, my life is not my own. I've been bought at a price. I don't want to live the rest of my time for the will of men, but for the will of God. I've spent enough of my past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. It's the love of Christ that compels me. I judge us that if one died for all, then all died, and we who live should live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died for us and rose again. And Paul just said, take my life. In fact, Paul would say, if I die and go to, to heaven, that's the best thing that could ever happen to me. Nevertheless, for, because it's more needful for you, I will stay around. And Christian, I just cannot share with you the highest, the, the glories and the greatest blessing of living your life not for yourself. And, and I, couldn't, I couldn't share it in a grand, grander way. But when our life becomes no longer me, but he and them, and these precious people that he's placed in front of me, whether I'm ever recognized for it or not, whether they're suffering along the way or not, whether it's ever reciprocated to me or not, but there's one that I've received a ministry from, and his name is Jesus. There's one race, one course that he set for me, and he's put me on that, and it's to testify to the gospel of the grace of God, the free riches of God, as Paul would say. That's what I want to do. It's one solitary life. It's one life I have to live. YOLO, right? And so let's live for Jesus. And it's only one life that he's given us. And Here's the thing about a race, you guys. God's given us this race. And it's differing starting places, different starting times, different finishing lines, different courses different strengths, but there is a race. Paul said, my race, not the race, and you're on a race. You don't want to be the, the, the tortoise sleeping, or the, the hare sleeping, the rabbit sleeping, but if, even if you're just the tortoise progressing, your life's not dear to yourself, and the Lord has called you for something greater. That's the life that Jesus came, and he ran, and he won, and he lived, And so we look to him, and I just want to encourage you that your life is worth very much to the Lord. 
and to the people around you. And if it's worth much to you, it'll be a hindrance of the first two. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto the Apostle Paul, no, although he's a great example here, rather, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Lord, thank you for the race that you've called us to live and to run. Thank you for this morning. And we just know that our lives have been given to us, not for us, but for you and for those whom you have placed in our life. We thank you for the example of the Apostle Paul, but only in as much as it points us to the life of Christ, of who you are for us, of your great sacrifice at Calvary for us, of your life lived, of that great sacrifice, of your resurrection and the presence of your spirit. And even now, Lord, as you call us to to love you, to worship you, to serve you, and to serve your people, Lord, we, we want our lives to be about your business. And we want to run our race right to the very end. And so give us strength to do so. Lord, we love you and we're thankful for the gospel. Lord, for anybody that's just beat up and condemned today, maybe sin has got in the way of this life to be lived for you. And maybe it's a sin that's just burdening you so great and you feel as though you would live for others, but your own sin is crippling you and you've just never been able to yourself seem to overcome it. And just you're filled with the weight of guilt and shame over it and it's kept you from pressing on trusting Christ and running the race that he has for you I'll remind you of the gospel of grace this morning that the Lord loves you he knows exactly what you've done where you've been and how long you'd be here Uh, none of this surprises him and he died for all of it His blood sufficient for your sin, past, present, future. And he just asks you to trust him again, to confess your sin and to receive his grace. And he's right here willing, so willing to pour it out in abundance upon you. And so we just look to him and receive of that. Let him free you from the guilt of it, the stain of it, the shame of it, the consequence of it, the pain of it, just the the power of it in your life. Just let him take it upon himself and and let him lead you on in a life of ministry and service to others, not so that you'd be recognized for it or credited for it, but just simply the joy of loving God and loving people. And Lord, we just pray that this would be effective in all our hearts and all our lives this morning. How greatly we love you. We're so thankful for the gospel. We love you, Jesus. Here's our lives. Take them, use them for your for your divine purposes, all for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.